when the very first program version start to breathe. That moment I realize I have something really good. A game is a beautiful thing. I hadn't met a person who touched that game and didn't get hooked on it. The pieces look so simple, but then the game actually is so deep. But it can be dangerous. It was a very heroic experience. I must assume that this was a deliberate attempt to frighten me. Но это как, знаете, попытаться танк руками остановить. Я понял, что включили уже, как это, бездушную машину. This is the story of four characters, two systems, and the one game that brought them together and set them apart. Moscow, January 1985. The Cold War lingered on. Gorbachev was months from power, and the world had yet to hear of Perestroika. The economic system was near collapse, and political freedom a distant dream. Yet in this repressive landscape stood a scientific institute where the brightest and best minds gathered. A place of intellectual freedom and creativity. Мы могли заниматься всем довольно свободно, всем, чем, что нас интересовало. Этим мы отличались от литераторов, филологов, на нас идеологически никто не воздействовал. Here at Moscow's computer center, scientists push their machines to the very edge of their capabilities. I was absolutely natural hacker. And computer was what really fascinates me. You could make computer do whatever you want. Literally. You just you just write instruction and it follows it. Alexei Pachitnyov's predecessors had discovered the concept of the nuclear winter and calculated the trajectory of Sputnik satellites. But Alexei's impact on history came in a very different form. In the spring of 1985, he had plans for his computer that extended far beyond its normal tasks. I always like all kinds of games and puzzles. When I was a schoolboy, we didn't have too much entertainment that, that year. The games were a big part of our pleasure time. So many people play chess, and other games and we really looked in, in the store for, for some kind of board games and, and spent quite a, quite a time on it. That's the very well-known puzzle game called Pentomino. It basically it consists of 12 different shapes made out of five squares. And the task is to put all of them in this box uh, like a jigsaw puzzle. And uh, it's a very well-known puzzle, and I love it very much, and I used to be pretty good at it. Let me, let me finish it. Oops, I forget how to do it. There we go. This way, that way. Alexei started to apply this favorite puzzle onto the computer. Something began to evolve at his terminal, but it was a painstaking process. Несколько месяцев это была вот какая-то непонятная работа, которую фактически было не видно вот. Но на экране что-то меняется. Лёша сопит, Лёша ходит, курит огромное количество папирос. 
The five square pieces of pentominoes became four square pieces that fell towards the bottom of the screen. It was the player's job to rotate these shapes and fit them together. A new game was born. They called it Tetris, from the Greek for four. When the very first program version started to breathe, what I call, when the first pieces appear on the screen and, uh, and become controllable, and that was very fascinating. Yeah. И вдруг, значит, вот он позвал нас э, с Мишей, говорит, вот, ребят, смотрите, получается, вроде бы как вот, вот так. Вот. Да, на экране появился этот знаменитый стакан, вот, в который падали, в общем, какие-то фигурки. Я, честно говоря, сразу даже и не понял. Вот. А Миша э, тут же стал, значит, давать совет. Было не просто стабилизировать скорость работы Тетриса на том компьютере, на котором он впервые был написан. Значит, здесь была моя помощь в поиске некоторого источника стабильной скорости. Even without sound and only the most basic graphics, this first version seemed to exert an unusual power. I did play a lot with this kind of strange prototype, and I can't stop it myself. Michael Kulagin and other people in my room asking, what are you doing here all the time? And then I let people play and I realized that it's not myself who is cuckoo and, 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 and get something wrong in the brain because everybody who touched this game can stop playing either. Народ стал собираться, начал играть в Тетрис. То есть было время, когда в Тетрис начал играть практически весь вычислительный центр. Тетрис spread throughout the computer center, infecting all in its path. Эта игра как-то произвела впечатление, то есть Многие наши сотрудники увлеклись этой игрой, часто в ущерб работы. Тетрис был заметен, потому что он отличался от других игр, американских в основном, где были бы убийства, выстрелы, взрывы, погони. Тетрис appeals to another side of the human psyche. One bent on construction rather than destruction. When you play Tetris, you have the impression that you build something. That has a spirit of constructivity. You have the chaos coming as a random pieces, and your job is to put them in order. But just as you construct the perfect line, it disappears. All that remains is what you fail to complete. Тетрис – это игра с очень сильной отрицательной мотивацией. Вы никогда не видите того, что вы сделали хорошо, а на экране у вас видны только ваши ошибки, и вам всегда их хочется исправить. What kind of get to your eyes all the time is your mistake, is your ugly holes, and that drive you to fix it all the time. The first color version was developed in the summer of 1985, and it was this version that Alexei handed out to friends outside the computer center, who in turn copied it to their friends. After that, kind of every place in Moscow, like a, like a, like a wood fire, you know, Tetris in two weeks were on every single computer appearing in Moscow. The game took hold and spread, first through Moscow, then through the Soviet Union, and finally out into the Soviet bloc countries. As it traveled, it did so freely, copied from disk to disk, unhindered by commercial constraints. Here, there was no notion of intellectual property rights. Individual ideas were owned by the state, to be shared among everyone. We didn't have the idea that the software is something which is 
could be considered as a product or be sold or protected or whatever. Made no sense for us at all. Это вот та сам торговля или продажа были уделом государства, но не отдельных людей. Если бы мы попытались, то, скорее всего, мы бы оказались в тюрьме, а не за клавиатурой компьютера. For now, the only thing that contained the spreading game was the Iron Curtain, which left Tetris a cult hit, and its inventor with recognition, but no reward. But Tetris was born into a changing world that had opened up a chink in the Iron Curtain. In the mid-80s, Hungary was successfully exporting puzzle games and computer technology to the West. Robert Stein made his money buying software from Hungary and selling it on in Britain. On a trip to the Hungarian Institute of Technology in early 1986, he saw the game that would prove both a blessing and a curse. We were wandering around in a big room with all kind of computers going, with all kind of software going, and somewhere in a corner I have seen a, a game which consisted of bricks coming down or some kind of shapes and was tucked away somewhere in a corner and I was asking, what is this? Others said, ignore it. So we wandered around and I kept coming back to that. After some reluctance, the Hungarians revealed that this wasn't actually their game and supplied Stein with the name of the Moscow Computer Center. He wasted no time in making contact, but found them rather indifferent to his requests to license the game. Nobody gives a shit about the stuff there, you know, small little game. Everything, computer center were, were pretty busy with the serious kind of uh, physical uh, differential equation of, of the entire outspace or nuclear war, you know. <laughs> Games was something absolutely alien for their nature. Alexei Pujitnyov ended up dealing with Stein's requests on their behalf. He proposed about something like 10,000 pounds for it as advance payment. I replied him that we are interested in his proposal and ready to continue, kind of talk, talk about this, and he interpret this facts as an as a agreement on everything. Casual agreements like this were normal among the gaming fraternity. But this was Russia. And this informal arrangement would soon bring Stein head to head with the might of the Soviet state. He set about peddling his newfound acquisition around British game producers. One of his favorites was Mirasoft, the software arm of the Maxwell Corporation. In 1986, this was a giant entertainment empire, owning newspapers, magazines, and even top-of-the-league football clubs. If they bought Tetris, Stein would have a real heavyweight player behind the game. I looked at it for a couple of minutes and passed it down to the technical department downstairs. And then a couple of weeks later, I wandered down at lunchtime. They were all in the office playing this game. So I said, well, OK, this is... Um, I better, have a, I better play it myself. So, um, took it home. It was now only a matter of time before Britain caught the Tetris bug. My wife accuses me of ruining the family Christmas because I'd found it addictive. But my wife found it addictive and so did my two young kids. While Mirosoft signed a deal to produce the game in Britain, Maxwell also had a software company in California, which could pave the way for the Tetris invasion of America. We were over there looking at different game titles that we could publish, market, sell, along with Jim. He said, you're going to like this. So I sat and I, I played Tetris for oh, a couple of hours and 
we went off and, and got a bite to eat and everybody else was ready to go home while I wanted to go back to the office and did and went back and played another three or four hours. Phil came back next day saying, this is great. It's a great product. The problem was what, you know, what techniques can we use to fly against the run as it was going of what the, the, the market was wanting for computer games. For inspiration of how to sell this simple game, they returned to its roots. The emergence of Mikhail Gorbachev created the perfect opportunity to manipulate both the fear and fascination of that land behind the Iron Curtain. The curiosity of having anything from, you know, the other side of the Iron Curtain uh, was kind of like memorabilia or something people wanted to have. We put it in red packaging. And uh, the first box, we, we actually set up the spelling of Tetris in Russian. We used the Soviet symbol as part of the Tetris name. The marketing worked. And with great press behind it, Tetris was set to be a big hit. But all the attention had an unforeseen consequence that was about to jeopardize everything. As we are about to launch the damn thing, we get a telex from a company called Hellorg, never heard of, in Russia, stating that we are illegally uh, trying to launch Tetris, because that belongs to them, and they have never given us permission to do it. Elorg, short for Elogtron Technica, was a government department established to deal with the foreign trade of software. Gorbachev was keen to create an export market to the West, but strictly under the control of the state. The Russian bureaucracy loves to have control on everything. It's, uh, if it is our, we wanna, we wanna have everything properly and quiet and and kind of perfectly done. Robert Stein was summoned to Moscow. There was always a long corridor, and first of all, they keep you waiting in the reception. Nobody talks to you, and all the chairs are uncomfortable, and then they lead you up, and they usher you into a room with a very long conference table. It was like you being questioned in a court because they shown an absolute distrust of whatever I was saying. Why did we do what we done without their permission? And I tried to explain to them I didn't even know they existed, never mind about their permission. Stein used all his powers of persuasion to get the Russians to sign a contract and Tetris was cleared for sale. Within weeks, it catapulted into the bestseller lists, and in its first year, sold over 100,000 copies in America alone. But sales were limited to those that owned a personal computer. The real mass market lay elsewhere. Home video games played through console machines that plugged directly into the TV and were operated with a remote controller. In 1988, this was a multi-billion dollar industry. Maxwell's company Mirosoft saw an opportunity and approached publisher Atari about creating a home video version of Tetris. They held the rights to the game as far as I knew at that moment. Uh, and they, they approached me to, to publish it for, for game consoles. So I, you know, I sort of took it to committee at Atari Games and, and everybody was crazy about it. The PC version of Tetris was ideally suited to adapting for a video game. Atari struck a deal and set about enhancing its visual appeal. 
I felt that puzzle pieces should be 3D. So we, you know, our, our engineers turned them into 3D sort of shaded things. I thought it looked much more polished and much less sort of PC game-ish. A lot of little things that, you know, just the way they're laid out on the screen made the game more exciting. From a commercial point of view, it was also exciting because the profit potential was enormous. By the middle of 1988, Alexei Pachitnyov's simple game was an extremely valuable asset, set to make millions for companies in Europe and North America. But there was one important market that remained untapped. Japan not only had a burgeoning consumer electronics industry, but also a long tradition of puzzle games. Hank Rogers was a young entrepreneur who traveled the world looking for games to produce for the Japanese market. I'd have my, my computer with me and I'd do a little spreadsheet, figure out how much money I could make on a title, and I'd be able to make a decision right there, make somebody an offer. It was at an American trade show that Hank met Atari's Randy Brolite and first saw the game that would make his fortune. Tetris was probably the quietest game at the show. Even then, products were graphically exciting and audio exciting. This game had a totally different thing. I wanted to play it, not because it was any of those things, but because it struck some basic chord and, and couldn't stop playing. Hank secured both PC and video game rights for Japan and returned home to create his own versions of Tetris. Tetris was evolving and expanding into three major world markets and everyone was cashing in. Everyone, that is, apart from the Russians. We'd send our money to Microsoft. Was Stein getting paid? Was he paying who he was supposed to pay? But somewhere along the chain, somebody wasn't paying. Elorg drafted in a new broom from Communist Party headquarters to sort things out. Nikolai Belikov's first job was to examine the original agreement with Robert Stein's company Andromeda Software. Что первый платеж должен был быть произведен в течение трех месяцев. Договор был подписан 10 мая 1988 года. Уже был октябрь. После этого я стал думать, что делать с этим договором, как заставить Андромеда Софтер платить деньги. As Belikov pondered this problem. Developments on the other side of the world were about to change his fortune. Industry giant Nintendo were about to launch a handheld game playing device and wanted to sell Tetris as part of the package. But first, they needed someone to discreetly secure them the rights. We showed Hank Rogers a prototype of Game Boy and a prototype of Tetris playing on Game Boy. Um, so he immediately uh, moved very quickly. Hank went straight to the top of the chain, to the one man who had been dealing directly with the Russians. I contacted Robert Stein. I said, Robert, you need to represent me uh, to get the rights to Tetris from, for Game Boy from, uh, from Russia. And uh, he agreed, and I sent him, uh, I think, twenty-five thousand dollars. I'm not surprised. I mean, anybody working with Bactia must. Little did he know that Stein had been discussing the same rights with Mirosoft. He was trying to muscle in on something which was spoken for the Tetris. On the other hand, I wasn't going to be dismissive of him because I seen him as a potential licensee of products which we produce or develop in Hungary. We were exchanging faxes on a, on a weekly basis for, I don't know, three months, and then I started getting nervous because it just seemed to be taking so long. And <clears throat> he said he was going to go to Russia, 
And he kept on saying that, and he wasn't going, so I became really suspicious. Robert Stein's negotiations with the Russians had reached an impasse over the money he owed them. Dramedo Soltok присылал и телексы с просьбой начать переговоры по новому лицензионному договору для игровых автоматов. Вот. Но моя реакция была на все эти телекс только одна. Сначала, пожалуйста, выполните условия первого подписанного договора, только после этого мы будем говорить, проводить переговоры по следующему лицензионному договору. By February 1989, Hank Rogers was tired of waiting around and increasingly suspicious that Stein was working for someone else. I guess I panicked and I said, I'll get me on a plane, this guy's going to get the rights for somebody else, and I need those rights. And so I, I was on a plane two days later, uh, going to Moscow. But Hank Rogers wasn't the only one flying into Moscow that week. Robert Stein was finally making the trip himself. And to complete the set, Mirosoft had secretly sent Kevin Maxwell to move along negotiations for their interests. Both Stein and Maxwell had meetings set for the same day. Hank had no such meeting arranged. He didn't even have an address for Elorg. I did know that I was going behind the Iron Curtain for the first time, but I had no idea what I was getting into. I kind of knew how to deal with people that were not from my original culture. So I was expecting to get off that plane and make friends. That's not what happened. I guess it's just the beginning of my trip and I'm in for a lot more. Hank recorded his adventure to take back to Japan. Take a look outside here. This is uh, Moscow. It looks pretty gray. That's because it's pretty gray. Everybody that I met was unfriendly and unhappy and grumpy. There was an information desk in the hotel. I asked them, a Lorg. They said, no, I can't find it. No attempt at going any further. Here I am, waiting for a phone call from Japan, watching video of Hawaii, because the TV doesn't work. The radio doesn't work. I've read everything I could read. Hank spent his first night in the in tourist hotel overlooking Red Square. Right at the heart of a seemingly impenetrable Soviet state. I got smart the next day and I hired an interpreter, which I'd never considered doing uh, before, but I hired an interpreter. I, f I figured they, they have to be able to help me. I have a very lovely interpreter. <laughs> Her name is... My name is Allah. <laughs> uh, your name is Allah. <laughs> okay, Allah has located uh, Elorg for us. So, this afternoon we should get a lot of things done. One big impression I got from Moscow at the time is there's no color anywhere. There's no advertisements. Nobody's trying to sell you anything. So the whole place is kind of bland. It's like all the color has been sucked out of, out of a city. On the 21st of February, there was a call from the protocol unit о том, что ко мне на встречу пришел иностранец из Японии, значит, его зовут Хэнк Роджерс, вот, и дальше мне было сказано, что это является нарушением режима, потому что в то время обязательно договариваться о встрече с иностранцем надо было заранее и давать информацию в протокольный отдел о том, что кто будет, какая цель, тема переговоров и так далее. You don't walk into a place like that uninvited. You have to have an invitation, and then your invitation has to be cleared with the KGB. Make sure that you are somebody above board. They do your background check before you ever have a meeting. I just walked in. A meeting was hastily convened for the next day. 
the same day Belikov was due to meet Maxwell and Stein. The following day would prove crucial for the future of Tetris. All would hinge on the communists' ability to play the capitalists at their own game. Already they understood the capitalist mantra of divide and rule. Я не понимал до конца, конечно, что за, за кем стоит, но я понимал, что нельзя допустить, чтобы каждый из трех сторон встретился друг другу. The first to arrive at Belikov's office was Hank Rogers, proudly clutching the video game he was producing in Japan. Как только мы сели за стол с господином Роджерсом, он без какого-то промедления достал такую коробочку. Честно говоря, я не понял, что это. И говорит, господин Беликов, я продаю ваш товар очень успешно. And I said, see, the, uh, we're publishing Tetris in Japan. We're the biggest publisher of Tetris in the world right now. Я сказал, и Лорк никому не давал права использования Тетриса для видео Home System. I said, no, 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 you did. And I turned the package around and I said, see, the rights go from Elorg to, to Mirrorsoft to Tengen and to uh, my company, Bulletproof Software. So that's, that's how I got the rights. It's, we never gave these rights to anybody. I thought, oh my gosh, something, something's wrong. I said, the only rights were before the company Andromeda and only for the use of Tetris on a personal computer. Far from picking up the additional rights he had hoped for, Hank was faced with the prospect that his existing rights were worthless. They were asking me really probing questions. Mr. Rogers, how did you, why did you think you got these rights? You know, these are the kind of thing that you would listen to in a, in a court or something like that. It wasn't like a friendly conversation. Он, конечно, был в шоке. В конце концов, он сказал, да, я не знал. Вы меня извините, я хочу работать с вами. У меня очень хорошие связи с крупнейшей компанией мира Nintendo. Это было 70% мирового рынка в то время. I thought, either I'm going to come out of this with the rights to Tetris, or I'm going to be in some gulag. Я в тот момент предложил только одно, чисто бюрократический ход. Господин Роджерс, напишите, пожалуйста, все, на бумаге. Он сказал, хорошо. Но так как у меня было ограниченное время, потому что я ожидал следующей встречи с Робертом Стайном, и не хотел, чтобы они встречались, чтобы все было независимо, я договорился о встрече на следующий день. Narrowly missing Hank, Robert Stein entered the corridors of Elorg with his own proposals unaware of what had transpired in the hours previously. I didn't know Hank Rogers appeared on the scene. I did not know till I came back to England that, for instance, Kevin Maxwell was out there. Robert Stein thought he had come to negotiate extra rights for himself. Elorg had different ideas. And instead, Belikov confronted him with his original contract. I said, Господин Стайн, скажите мне честно, скажите, пожалуйста, как этот документ называется? Он говорит, соглашение. Он говорит, не соглашение, это набор каких-то фраз безответственных, по которым одна сторона передала права, а другая сторона не выполняет, не компенсирует право использования этих прав. I must assume that this was a deliberate attempt to uh, frighten me or put me in difficult situation. But this mob across the conference table was anything but friendly. Stein was dismissed and told to come back the next day, buying Belikov time to discover what Kevin Maxwell had to offer. К этому моменту я уже знал, что Роберт, Кевин Максвелл – это младший сын Роберта Максвелла. Роберт Максвелл – это очень могущественный человек, один из самых богатых в мире. Поэтому, конечно, я был очень напряжен. Кевин Максвелл's father had very good connections within the Russian government. 
After discussing the handheld rights, Belikov tentatively mentioned Hank's cartridge, which also carried the name of Mirosoft. Yes, Mr. Gospodin, Kevin Marshall. Это использование прав на телевизионные приставки. Где Мирасов взял эти права? И неожиданно он сказал, это пиратская версия. Мы не имеем прав. This was an innocent mistake from Maxwell, who was unaware that Mirosov had sold video game console rights to Atari. But it was a costly one for his company. Я спросил господин Максу, а вы заинтересованы получить права для телевизионных приставок? Он сказал, да, конечно. Я говорю, а когда вы можете дать предложение? Он сказал, мне нужно вернуться в Великобританию. Очень быстро я вам пришлю наше предложение. The day had provided the Russians with a valuable lesson in capitalism, and they proved quick learners. They understood that they could maximize profits from this one game by selling different rights to different companies. For those on the other side of the table, there was everything to play for, although one was already working an advantage. Finally, out of all this dressed and suit businessmen which kind of tried to make some licenses, I've seen the guy who really likes and understands the game, and uh, and somehow we like each other almost immediately. This is uh, Mr. Alexei Pazitno. Uh, he is the author of uh, of uh, Tetris. Play Tetris, my friends. Okay. I made friends with Alexei immediately. He was the friend that I was looking for in Russia. You know, we got together that night and we started talking about game design. We immediately jumped into, okay, what are we going to do for Tetris 2? And, you know, it's, it's, we had stuff to talk about. The next morning, Elok's Nikolai Belikov hatched a plan that would leave no ambiguity as to the rights the Russians had already negotiated away. This hinged on a definition of computer which he needed to ensure couldn't include products like video game consoles. So, he added a clause to Stein's original contract. Для того, чтобы понимать, что он может что-то начать думать, зачем это нужно, я искусственно увеличил штрафные санкции за каждый день. Я знал, что это нереальные цифры. Но мне было нужно, чтобы он но сконцентрировал свое внимание на этих цифрах, которые был готов естественно уменьшить. Belikov was a son of a bitch. The clause resulted in the exclusion of some of the products where Tetris was on, and I didn't notice it, which I will never forgive myself. So there we go. But they made it so matter of fact. Yeah, we would like you for the sake of bureaucracy. And I agreed because I was so focused in getting what I wanted and I forgot about watching what they wanted. Belikov dispatched Stein, bereft of rights he thought he already had and with two weeks to pay them what he owed. He now faced the arrival of Hank Rogers and a decision about who to grant the handheld rights. I am on my way to 10 o'clock appointment with LRG. Last night I composed a proposal to them about gaining the rights to uh, handheld Tetris. We shall see. Under the old system, the decision would have been a straightforward political one. But capitalism is about taking risks. I said, well, Kevin Maxwell is the son of a very rich man, so I can't match his money, but I can give you an honest business. I can tell you, I will tell you exactly how much money I'm making and you can get your share, and I'll be open. Hank shows himself very, very honest. In, in, in many respects and, and very reliable as 
he keep his words, he kept his words all the time. Позиция Алексея Пажетного была за Хэнк, потому что сам Кевин Максов был очень, как человек очень сложный, он смотрел на всех свысока. И, конечно, Алексея Пажетного это отталкивало. Hank's direct approach paid off. Alog told him the handheld rights were his. We signed and the, the big boss, Dr. Trifonov, came out and shook my hand with this iron fist, iron grip, whatever. And uh, we signed and it was all done. And they said, we, there's Mr. Rogers, something else we'd like you to, to talk to you about. Uh, we would like you also to make us an offer on the, on the console rights. Hank Rogers left Russia with the handheld rights to Tetris and the prospect of holding on to his precious console rights. But there would be a battle ahead. Atari games were already busy manufacturing their own Tetris game under an agreement with Mirosoft. We built half a million units for our day one launch. We put a major investment in terms of our our best human resources, the, the, the engineers assigned to the game uh, at Atari were, you know, without peer. They're, they're our best guys. Such was their confidence in Tetris, they also invested heavily in marketing. We had a huge party for the media and rolled it out with all kinds of fanfare and, and so forth. We also had, a, we took a full page of USA Today uh, to, to announce, the, announce the program. But Atari were in for a surprise. In Seattle, Hank Rogers was visiting his contacts at Nintendo to offer them exclusive console rights. Their Nintendo Entertainment System was the biggest selling video game console in the world. As soon as we found out that the home video game rights were available and at the same time that uh, Hank had cut a deal for the uh, handheld rights, uh, we were absolutely delighted. For Howard Lincoln and Minoru Arakawa, this provided the ideal opportunity to get back at arch-rivals Atari. And they said, we will help you, so go back and if you, if you uh, think you've got it in the bag, call us, we'll come and we'll help, we'll clinch the deal. Atari were not the only complication. In Britain, Robert Maxwell found out that his son had lost out on the handheld rights. He was furious and began contacting senior ministers within the Kremlin. Он обвинил меня в том, что я своими неправильными действиями взорвал торгово-экономические отношения между СССР и Великобританией. The Kremlin began to exert pressure on Belikov and his position was under threat. Hank sensed it was imperative he get his deal signed with Elog as soon as possible. I went back to Moscow and uh, I asked the Russians, would it clinch the deal if I brought Mr. Arakawa and Mr. Lincoln? Absolutely. Nintendo needed to move quickly and quietly. They had to avoid alerting either Maxwell or Atari, who were about to have the video game console rights snatched from under their noses. We told all of our employees that we were going to Japan. And I think only one employee at Nintendo of America was aware of where we were actually going. In Moscow, they signed a deal worth half a million dollars in guaranteed royalties and 50 cents on every cartridge. Over 30 times what Stein had first offered the Russians, but a fraction of what the game was worth to Nintendo. When we flew back across to Seattle, every time I looked at Arakawa and he looked at me, we just started laughing because we knew we had not only the handheld rights, but we had the home video game rights as well. And at the same time, found a way to really uh, uh, give it back to uh, Atari games.
Back in Moscow, the pressure was piling onto Belikov. 23 марта я получил этот телекс. Длинный такой. У нас факса в то время еще не было. Этот телекс был послан Кевину Максу, которому он сообщил, что вопрос, что я не совершил ряд ошибок, что вопрос поднят будет во время предстоящего визита в Лондон президента Горбачева. Здесь шли угро, а то, угроза от угрозы. То есть это уже был не бизнес. It was a two very, very powerful sides or organization fight for my small game. We got in a very sharp and hot place. Потом был звонок от представителя, от человека, который занимался подготовкой визита Горбачева, который настоятельно предложил мне немедленно лететь в Лондон, стать на колени перед Робертом Максом и умолять его ни слова не говорить Горбачеву, потому что иначе, если он скажет хоть одно слово, меня просто больше не будет. Это были дословные слова. Ощущение у меня, естественно, было чисто человеческое. Мне стало страшно. Потому что я понял, что... Ну, это как, знаете, попытаться танк руками остановить. Вот он движется, попробуйте его руками остановить. Я понял, что включили уже, как это, бездушную машину. Вот, государственную. Которая совершенно не интересует никакие доводы. Оказалось, что это вот... But Belikov had history on his side. Gorbachev's reforms meant that the state machine was losing its grip on power. Я, конечно, понимаю, что здесь повезло мне, что это был 89 год. Если бы это было бы, как я понял, 88 год, история была бы другая. Я уверен в этом. In America, the battle for Tetris was only just beginning. A jubilant Nintendo plunged the knife in. First thing we did was to send a notice to Atari Games advising them that we had the sole home video game rights to Tetris and uh, putting them on notice of that and directing them to cease and desist from any uh, marketing or production of Tetris, uh, knowing full well that uh, they'd go nuts. Atari games were not about to take this lying down. They had already invested millions preparing Tetris for markers. One of my associates called to say that we had just been sued by Atari games so they took the first step and they sued us uh, and claimed that they had the exclusive rights to Tetris. All of our experts, our legal counsel, were all saying full speed ahead, you know, damn the torpedoes. There's no, there's no inkling that we were wrong. The trial between Nintendo and Atari was set to commence in November 1989. Nintendo had prepared Elog's Nikolai Belikov as their key witness. Перед моим отъездом мне пригласили в Государственный комитет по исследовательной технике и информатике. Вот, и сказали, если вы проиграете суд, то будет создана специальная комиссия, который рассмотрит вопрос один. Сколько миллионов американских долларов потеряло советское государство от ваших непродуманных действий? Беликов joined Hank Rogers in San Francisco, where they waited to testify. Both had a lot resting on the outcome. In the end, they were spared the witness stand. The judge made a summary judgment which granted all video game rights to Nintendo. It made both Mr. Arakawa and I feel wonderful. Just great. 
there was jubilation, of course. Well, on my part, I got to keep the rights, <laughs> so you know, I had a lot riding on it. At that point in time, <laughs> Atari Games had uh, several hundred thousand um, Tetris cartridges for play on the NES that were now uh, worthless. We were in absolute shock. We had cartridges ready to ship and firm orders, and we were suddenly enjoined from shipping them. We were absolutely shocked and, and dismayed. Я помню, включил на полную мощность приемник, мы нарушали все. Он носился на этой машине по Сан-Франциско, а там горы. Я был, честно говоря, в шоке. Мне было все замедленно. Вот эта радость, она для меня пришла намного позже. Стал страх, испуг уходить. Я могу возвращаться обратно. То есть я вернулся в любом случае, но... Я могу возвращаться. The real winners were Nintendo. To date, Nintendo dealers across the world have sold 8 million Tetris cartridges on the Nintendo Entertainment System. The people at uh, Marisoft and Atari Games were simply incompetent. They they didn't do their homework, they didn't do what they should have done, and uh, far from taking advantage of them, it was simply competent people taking advantage of some incompetent businessmen. By the time Atari figured out who to blame, it was too late. On the 5th of November 1991, Robert Maxwell disappeared over the side of his yacht, leaving a company ridden in unseen debt and 440 million pounds missing from the corporation's pensions fund. After Mr. Maxwell disappeared and you know, it was like a house of cards that just sort of crumbled to the ground and, and everything that we thought we, you know, we were looking to as indemnification and safety was basically non-existent. As Atari's fortunes continued to wane, Nintendo went from strength to strength. Tetris was key to the success of Game Boy, which has sold 70 million worldwide. But despite all that happened to his game, as the 80s drew to a close, Alexei Pachinov had yet to receive anything from Tetris. He was still working at the computer center. К сожалению, владельцем программы в то время это был Советский Союз, еще раз подчеркиваю, в общем, был вычислительный центр, поэтому особых доходов с этой работы Леша и не рассчитывал получить. Даже вот пажетному заплатить хорошую премию мы были не в состоянии. Эти цифры надо было согласовывать с руководством, с президиумом Академии наук. But the fame that Tetris had brought Alexei meant that he could aspire to life beyond the computer center. After the Tetris success, I don't want to be very much involved in pure scientific stuff. I realized that that games is a, uh, might be a very big part of my activity as well. In 1991, with help from his friend Hank Rogers, Alexei was offered the opportunity to move with his family to the United States. Here lay the promise of taking control of his own destiny and that of the games he developed. His wife had been to the States before. When she came back, they asked her and she tried to explain and she could do nothing except cry. She just couldn't find the words to describe the difference, what they were missing in this, in this whole culture. Alexei settled in Seattle, 
where he established a company to develop games and technology. But his American dream was not all he had hoped for. Basically, I need to make money to, to support my family. I wasn't that rich to just, just sit there and do nothing. So, so I could say that the first couple of years were, were very challenging in the United States. In 1996, Alexei gave up working for himself and joined that great American institution, Microsoft, where he now has a staff job. They hired me just to make games. I feel myself a really strong and experienced game designer at this point. I don't have any kind of internal contradictions or tendencies, so I, I understand that I am staying in my place and doing my job and fulfill my mission in life. When the original set of rights expired in 1996, Alexei began to receive some royalties from Tetris, if only a fraction of what he could have made if born into a different system. You always could make a little bit more than you made. But you know, I never, I never seriously think about this stuff. I live as I live. Alexei regularly returns to Moscow and thinks about moving back for good. But the city that gave birth to his game is no longer the place it was. Global capitalism has come to town. The same forces that enabled Tetris to conquer the free world have left the institute where it was nurtured far behind. Институт наш стареет. Средний возраст у нас сотрудников 50 лет. И я боюсь, что институт лет через 10, если так будет продолжаться, вообще погибнет. The average monthly wage of $200, deemed so respectable in Soviet times, can't compete with the lure of private institutions and foreign firms. You know, in Russia, the most popular strategy is the strategy on Avosy. Она часто нас выручала во время войн. Поначалу мы проигрывали, поначалу у нас было безнадега. Любая другая страна, наверное, была бы разрушена и погибла. А Россия как-то выкручивалась и как-то находила варианты для выживания. Я надеюсь, что здесь что-то будет такое же. Tetris is set to conquer the world once again, this time on the mobile phone.